Welcome, everyone, to another episode of U.S.-China Dialogue, the show in which myself and Professor Chen Dingding. Hi, Dingding. Hi, Nathan. How are you? Good, thanks. Where we talk with experts from the U.S. and China about uh, issues in the U.S.-China relationship of particular interest and concern. Uh, we're delighted to have a really remarkable group of people to speak to today about the war in Ukraine on competing U.S.-Chinese perspectives and on ways in which this might be an occasion for cooperation between the U.S. and China or potentially a reason for the relationship to get any worse. Um, Ding Ding, I'm excited about this conversation. I think it's an important one that we're about to have. Me too. Uh, arguably, it's the one of the most critical issues facing us uh, today in the world. You know, Ding Ding, oftentimes we've had these occasions to chat right after something big has happened in the U.S.-China relationship. And in theory, we were going to have this conversation right after Secretary Anthony Blinken's speech on China. But of course, that speech was postponed. I wonder, though, if you've followed any of the reporting about the speech and if you have any insights as to how that will be received in China once it is delivered sometime in the near future. Yes, uh, in China, people were uh, eagerly anticipating the uh, a speech by uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, but uh, now it's been delayed. Uh, I think uh, it's a very important speech because it's the first time uh, since Biden uh, took over, the US government will lay out a big uh, strategy, uh, if you will, uh, toward China. So I think uh, uh, the topic we're discussing today, by the way, is uh, already, uh, I think, being uh, taken into account in that speech. So we all look forward to that. For sure. I think this topic will be one of the key elements in the speech. But why don't we get into the topic then and invite our terrific group up on stage and introduce them to you and jump into our conversation? Please, let's bring up our excellent panelists. Great, well, welcome everyone. It's really wonderful to have you all here. As we've done before, I'm gonna introduce our Chinese guests and Ding Ding will introduce our American guests. So first, let me introduce Professor Chi Hai Xia, a professor from the School of International Relations at Tsinghua University, uh, where she's the Scientific Committee Chairman in the Tsinghua International Relations Data and Computing Lab and the Director of the Center for Asia Pacific Security Studies. Her research fields are China's foreign policy, Conflict Resolution and Mediation, and Big Data International Relations. Welcome so much, Professor Chi. Now we have Professor Avery Goldstein. Professor Avery Goldstein is the David Knott Professor of Global Politics and the International Relations in the Political Science Department, Inaugural Director of the Center for Study of Contemporary China, and Associate Director of the Christopher Brown Center for International Politics at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on international relations, security studies, and Chinese politics. Welcome, Avery. Thank you, glad to be with you today. And we also have Professor Yao Yang, Liberal Arts Chair Professor at the China Center for Economic Research and the National School of Development at Peking University. He is also the Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University and the editor of the house journal China Economic Quarterly. Uh, he serves as the chairman of many different uh, bodies uh, within the Chinese academic world. He's a member of the China Economist 50 Forum. Um, he's published uh, very widely in international and domestic journals um, and is also a prolific writer for magazines and newspapers, including the Financial Times and the Project Syndicate, where he most recently has just published a new piece on China's and US uh, potential for cooperation over the war in Ukraine. Uh, welcome, Dean Yao. Very nice to participate. And we have Susan Sorton. Susan Sorton is a former career US diplomat who retired in 2018 as acting assistant secretary of state for East Asia and the Pacific affairs. She's currently a visiting lecturer at a Yale Law School and the senior fellow at the law school's Pao Chai China Center. Sorton is also director of the Forum on Asia Pacific Security at the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. Welcome, Susan. Thanks, Ding Ding. Great to be here. Great. What a great group. Um, and we're really excited that we can bring uh, US and Chinese participants to talk about this in this public forum. 
on such an important topic. I think this is quite a unique opportunity. And so we're really grateful that you're all doing this. Why don't we start um, by asking uh, our Chinese guests to explain what the Chinese perspective on the war in Ukraine is. When we may perhaps because I just referenced Dean uh, Yao's uh, commentary in Project Syndicate, why don't I invite you uh, to first say in a few initial words about the Chinese perspective on the war in Ukraine? Uh, okay, uh, actually, I'm not an IR person. Uh, I'm an economist by training, but uh, somehow I got into uh, uh, IR a, a lot recently. Uh, but let me uh, just uh, say a few words uh, from the China side. Uh, inside China, there is a wide agreement uh, that uh, the war uh, was uh, uh, tried to. Uh, that the war was a tragic uh, tragedy for uh, uh, both Russia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, but uh, from the China side, uh, we see the war could be uh, avoided uh, from the very beginning. And uh, United States uh, and also NATO as a whole might have to uh, take uh, some responsibility. Uh, this is because, you know, uh, when uh, Soviet Union uh, was uh, uh, disintegrated, uh, uh, Russia actually wanted to uh, go back or to go to the Western camp, right? To embrace uh, Western culture or sorts. But uh, the West rejected, uh, United States rejected many times. Uh, on the other hand, uh, NATO uh, want to expand its border uh, to uh, the border of uh, Russia. Right. Uh, so that, uh, at least uh, uh, to you know, major view in China, that actually cornered uh, Russia. Right. Uh, so that's going to have a, a tragic reaction from the Russian side. And the many Chinese, uh, in my age, read a lot of uh, Russian literature. And from the literature we have read, we understand uh, Russia is another country that's going to bend to foreign pressure. Uh, Russian culture is resilient. You think about the, uh, Napoleon's uh, inv invasion of Russia. Uh, Russians uh, burned down Moscow and uh, then uh, fought back. Okay, so I, I, I think I, I don't believe that the United States uh, was intentional to drag Russia into a war. The United States uh, actually. Uh, miscalculated uh, the the whole thing right? and uh, didn't pay enough respect uh, to Russia in that regard. Um, from the U US China relations perspective, I believe, like I wrote in my project, the syndicate the piece, uh, this could be an opportunity for US and China to improve their relations. Uh, for uh, two reasons. Uh, one, uh, China, uh, you know, in American view, could be an uh, ideal ally of Russia, but China uh, didn't uh, provide uh, military assistance uh, to Russia. Okay, and uh, China, uh, to a large extent, at least those Chinese uh, commercial entities, uh, respected. Uh, America's and the NATO's uh, uh, sanctions uh, on uh, Russia. Okay. And then second, uh, uh, the two leaders uh, of the two countries uh, had uh, a very lengthy uh, online meeting. And then my understanding is that uh, the two leaders uh, had some understanding uh, for uh, the two countries' relations. So, uh, for those two reasons, I believe this could serve as an opportunity uh, for the two countries uh, to come together. So Dean Yao, let me interrupt you for a second. Um, we're gonna get uh, deeper into the US-China dimensions of the problem over the course of this conversation. But just for now, I want to uh, establish what the Chinese perspective is and invite Professor Chi if she wants to supplement any of your initial comments about the Chinese perspective on the war in Ukraine. Hi, Nisa. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to share my opinion about um, this war. I think that when I 
listen to the news about this uh, um, Russia uh, Ukraine war. I, I'm 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 astonished. Uh, but I think that maybe uh, there are some deep rooted reasons or I ask scholars need to analyze. I think that <clears throat> when we go back to the what happened last year, we can find the signals that can accelerate the happening of this war. That is Americans retreat from Afghanistan. When we read the news last year, we can find the US try its best to balance in China. Then what will other major parts react or response to the bilateral uh, relations between China and the US. We, they can find that that is a good chance to to gain their um, to gain their best interest. Uh, some 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 states choose balancing. Some place play, some states choose hedging, and we can find Russia think this is the best opportunity to gain its national interest because U.S. try uh, try to balance in China. And uh, of course, U.S. cannot uh, mm, cannot fight together with two major powers at the same time. So I think uh, uh, although there are some other reasons, I think uh, U.S.-China this year, especially last year, may be the most important factor we need to notice. And so we can go back to what happened now. In the battlefield, we can find although US and the European states choose many, many manners to punish you, Russia, we can find that they dislike to be entangled into the battlefield. And that is also a proof a proof to 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 hear for Russia to 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 sustain their judgment. The major enemy of U.S. is China, not Russia. So I think that may be also another reason why this war will last for a long time. I guess that's my opinion. So I think the cooperation between China and the U.S. is very important for the world peace because when we cooperate. Uh, other states, they don't want to uh, stand one side or the other to gain their their own national interest. They can find there are no chance. So that's my, my opinion. I think it's very important for both states to cooperate and to find the uh, solution, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. I, I, I wanted to just add that uh, in China, uh, maybe from the government perspective, this is a, a truly a dilemma for China because China, on the one hand, does want to maintain a good, uh, you know, friendly relationship with the U.S., but on the other hand, China is a very uh, close partner with Russia from many perspectives. And this war, this conflict, now is putting China in a very different, difficult position as to how to balance, you know, these two important relationships. But I guess. We wanted to hear from both Susan and Avery. Uh, what do you think of the U.S. perspective is uh, with regard to this war? Avery, maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Sure. Um, well, um, I, I appreciate the comments from our Chinese colleagues. Um, what I'm going to tell you is um, both what I think is at least an American perspective. I don't know if there is a U.S. official perspective on the war. Uh, but I think my view on what the U.S. perspective is is probably widely shared, which is that the war, obviously a tragedy for the people of Ukraine, uh, but more than that, uh, the war is a result of a blatant violation of international law when Russia launched a war of aggression that violates Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, Ukraine's a U.N. member state whose sovereignty and territorial borders have been recognized since 1991 by all states, including Russia. Uh, Russia's aim apparently was to either annex all of Ukraine or to carry out a war of regime change and install a Russian-backed puppet regime in Kiev. Um, and it's true that Moscow justifies the uh, what they call a special military operation by citing its security concerns about NATO's eastward expansion since the, the mid-1990s um, and the fear that NATO, excuse me, Ukraine would join NATO. The fact is that NATO, uh, Ukraine was not anywhere close to joining NATO before February 24th. 
Uh, and the bottom line is that Russia, like any state, indeed has legitimate security concerns. And I do think it has legitimate reasons to be concerned about NATO's eastward expansion. But those concerns could be, uh, and I would argue indeed were being addressed diplomatically through Russia's efforts, uh, diplomatically and also through Russia's efforts to deploy military forces on Russian soil that would address its concerns about uh, NATO expansion. Uh, but the security concerns that Russia had simply couldn't, could not be legitimately addressed by launching a war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, a war that uh, ironically, or at least perhaps surprisingly, has actually worsened Russia's security by strengthening NATO's solidarity and uh, apparently convincing Finland and Sweden that they may need to join NATO ad to address their own security concerns about a Russia that has demonstrated its willingness to use force against its neighbors. And so in many respects, I see this war as a tragedy for uh, Ukraine, uh, a new challenge we'll come back to talking about for US-China relations, and ultimately a strategic blunder by Russia that is gonna undermine its uh, own security. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Avery. That's a very uh, insightful analysis of uh, uh, at least the one US perspective. So Susan, you had worked uh, within the government before. So how do you think about this uh, uh, war from the US perspective? Yeah, thanks, Ding Ding. I mean, I, I did work in Russia, actually, when it was, I worked in the Soviet Union, and then I worked in our embassy in Moscow in 2010 and 2011. I worked in the former Soviet Union for many years. So I have to say, to see what's unfolding now is a, is a great personal um, disappointment and regret for me. Um, I speak Russian, <laughs> so I have a lot of friends in Russia. And um, I think what Avery said is certainly um, a widely held view in the United States about the immediate antecedents to this war and how people feel about Russia's violation of international law. I mean, this is a watershed event. People certainly see this as um, potentially returning us to an era you know, prior to the construction of the international system and all of the safeguards. Um, where, you know, might makes right, big powers will take what they see fit to do and weaker powers will just have to, um, you know, settle for that. Um, I think it's also really important to note that Russia was part of the 1994 pact that was signed, um, the Budapest Memorandum to guarantee Ukraine's security when they voluntarily, although under some duress, uh, agreed to give up their nuclear weapons. So that's another consideration that we should probably talk about. But I do, and I'm really intrigued by what um, Dean Yao said with respect to NATO's responsibility, with respect to the efforts to integrate Russia into the international system post collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, with the feeling that Russia had of certainly uh, grievance, obviously. I mean, I think we could probably all agree that the, the um, you know, degree of Russia's grievance is um, probably out of proportion potentially to what has been happening. But nevertheless, um, I think that, you know, there, we can talk about what could have been done maybe in the run up to the war to try to stop it. I think generally, though, that on the Chinese side and in many eyes, um, you know, people are giving too short a shrift to the efforts made by the West to try to integrate Russia. And maybe we all need to take a reality check about sort of what would have been the prospects realistically for, you know, a great superpower nation like Russia um, to deal peacefully with the complete disintegration of its empire and you know how how much effort we made and whether any effort would have would have you know really been sufficient to uh, help th them integrate smoothly so um, I think you know there's maybe things we could have done along the way to show M Russia more respect but you know we've invited Russia into the G8 we, we did a lot of things so I mean a lot of this you know, in hindsight, it looks easy to sort of say that we could have managed all of this in some kind of top down way. But the fact of the matter is, at the time, there were a lot of events that were happening that, you know, made it very difficult to to do so. 
Maybe Dean Yao, mm -hmm. could you take up Susan's invitation to say a further word about the NATO expansion point? And in particular, I think the way that Susan framed it, that it'd be interesting to hear your perspective and what you think a Chinese perspective might be on the question of proportionality. Because as Susan said, there is some uh, discussion even in the US about you know, whether the story of NATO expansion contributed in some way or whether there's ways in which that should have been rethought. Um, but was this response proportional to that pro problem? I mean, that's clearly a perspective in the US. How would, how would that uh, appear in the Chinese context, this question of proportionality that Susan mentioned? Uh, well, uh, NATO's uh, Easter expansion uh, was a reason. Uh, it was not just uh, that reason, right? Uh, you think about the Russian history, you know, starting from Peter the Greatest, right? Uh, Russia want to become a Western country, okay? Uh, but uh, the West never sincerely accepted uh, Russia as one of the Western countries, okay? Probably that's good for China. Right? Otherwise, uh, the NATO's border is going to be with China's. Okay, I still remember uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, uh, China was so worried that Putin uh, was going to let Russia into the breeze of the West. And the China would uh, face a huge pressure uh, from this uh, long, 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 uh, you know, uh, Russia-China border. Okay, and luckily that didn't happen. Okay. From the China's perspective, that is actually good. Uh, but uh, think about uh, uh, Russia, right? Uh, it, it is uh, a kind of a loss. I've heard from uh, my friends, you know, uh, Putin actually openly said this, the West doesn't want to accept us. My wife and I travel to Moscow, right? Uh, because we read uh, so much uh, Russian literature. So we walked around. We just uh, saw this uh, falling empire. We felt uh, really sad, okay? Even we Chinese felt uh, sad. Let's think about the Russians, how they felt about their history, about this uh, falling empire, okay? And let's uh, not forget after the First World War, how the West, uh, Western allies uh, treated uh, Germany. How uh, Keynes warned uh, uh, the West if uh, the West didn't take uh, Germany into the world system, then there would be dire consequence. And the Keynes was uh, just uh, right. I think there is some area of agreement here uh, uh, with Dean Yao's comments. Um, Insofar as I think you can make the argument that uh, NATO expansion and the failure to integrate Russia into the West contributed, created the conditions that made it possible for a Russian leader one day to have the perspective that it had uh, that led Putin to decide to launch the war. Uh, just as the conditions created by the Versailles punitive peace and the failure to integrate Germany into the world order created the conditions that made it possible for Hitler to rise to power and launches wars of aggression. But those permissive conditions, the background conditions, I don't think uh, either excuse Hitler's aggression in the 1930s and 40s, nor can they excuse uh, Putin's aggression today. Yeah, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, you know, uh, arguing for Russia's invasion. I, I don't think that's the point here. The point is how a victor treats uh, the defeated, okay? I still remember uh, just uh, one week before Gorbachev signed the disintegration of the uh, Soviet Union, he met with uh, President Bush, uh, I think uh, uh, in Spain, right? There was a meeting in Spain. President Bush asked uh, uh, him, uh, what's uh, going on uh, inside your country? Gorbachev said, uh, no, no, we are okay. But if one day, Soviet Union uh, is gone. Please don't say this is a victor of uh, the liberal world. But we know what the President Bush has said, right? On the same day, he said that this is a victory of the liberal world. Exactly. Okay. Let's just slam into Gorbachev's face directly. And the, in the West, 
particularly the United States, uh, did many times on the face of Putin. Okay. So you have to try to understand, you know, you are a victor. You are the largest, the strongest country in the world. I think uh, Americans have lost the sense of how the world is feeling about the dominance of the United States. That's very dangerous. Uh, this is China is the same, okay? You have to treat uh, people, you know, treat other people uh, like a equal. Uh, China today also ask you for the same thing. You have to you treat China as equal as possible. But I don't think the United States is ready to do that. I think this has been really useful so far in just um, establishing a few different uh, ideas about how just initial perspectives about what's going on um, in Ukraine and what Russia's uh, actions mean in a larger perspective. Um, there's, there's obviously some differences here, um, and that's very useful to explore. Um, eventually, we want to kind of bring this back to how the U.S. and China um, are, are, are potentially their relationship is implicated by all of this. But before we do that, and I know Susan wanted to jump in, I wonder if we can um, say a little bit more about how the rest of the world views this. And maybe that's something that Susan, um, in addition to whatever else you wanted to add, um, you could say a word about uh, that perspective, because of course we see that, um, especially in the global South, uh, there seems to be um, some conflicted uh, positions about all of this. Um, and Europe obviously is is very much on the, the side of the US here. So maybe you could add a few words about that larger global perspective. Thanks, that's exactly what I wanted to talk about. I think it's impossible to talk about this conflict without reflecting on US-Europe relations, where they've been, uh, the fact that the alliance is now, the Biden administration has made a huge effort to strengthen it. And Europe feels that they had uh, settled on a very sort of peaceful international environment and had been uh, not too worried, frankly, about their security over the last you know, several decades. Uh, and now all of a sudden has received a shock uh, with this war in Ukraine. Obviously, we have refugee flows into many, many countries of the European Union, which are forcing them to reckon frontally with the after effects and um, you know, all of the various perturbations of the war. Um, certainly, it's not seen in the same way in reaches of the globe that are farther from the conflict. And many of those places see this as a kind of return to the Cold War, a proxy war between the, the West and Russia, and don't really want to get involved in this kind of conflict between major powers. So we saw that in um, the abstention of, of several of the countries in the global south on the UN resolutions, which frankly was extremely disappointing because if there's a UN resolution that every member of the UN should have found a way to vote for its condemnation of this kind of territorial aggression. Um, and we did see the UN manage to act when we saw the last case, which was in Iraq in 1990. So um, Iraq and Kuwait. So I think uh, we do see sort of the shaking of the foundations of the international system, because in this case, it's a major veto wielding power that's undertaking the action. But, but Europe and then the rest of the world are having, you know, uh, in a way, very different views of the conflict. Just on that point, you mentioned, Susan, now about the, the um, international law principle of uh, territorial sovereignty. I wonder if, if any of the Chinese guests, including if, if my co-host Ding Ding wants to say something about how that point is registering within the Chinese discourse, because as we all know, that's traditionally been something that, um, you know, Chinese uh, scholars of international relations, international law, and the Chinese government itself have, have taken very, very seriously this question of territorial integrity and and not, not interfering uh, across territorial boundaries. Okay, okay. I think that this is the international law uh, because we 
China government stressed the importance of sovereignty and we dislike the interference of uh, internal issues. Uh, we respect uh, the interdependent in independence of uh, each state. Uh, I think that is the principle. Uh, so I think that's why China is very hard uh, to choose uh, the clearly support here in this war. That's the reason. Although we are the close friend and the <clears throat> strategic partner of uh, Russia, I think uh, it's very hard for China to, to, to pronounce the clearly support. Uh, that's that's because of the because because of we we we, we obey the international norm. Mm. That, that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Right. And I, I, I just add uh, maybe one small comment that I think uh, China has called uh, all parties to uh, you know adhere uh, with uh, territorial integrity, and that's why China has called. Uh, all parties to have a peaceful negotiation and to stop the uh, fighting. And I think this is consistent with uh, China's own position that uh, all countries' uh, territorial integrity should be respected. And, uh, you know, but again, as why this has happened, of course, um, different uh, experts tend to look at uh, a different, uh, whether it's historical, or, or political or, or military or security uh, perspective. So uh, there are always multiple uh, causes for any kind of a, a major uh, outcome in international politics as history has already taught us. So this is no different, right? This is um, a, even as big as it is, maybe looking back 10 years from now, it wouldn't be uh, as uh, significant as we are thinking right now. We don't know yet. This is still early uh, for, uh, you know, very early in the, in the stage. I think we will maybe reach um, a better understanding after three months or even six months after that. But I think as for territorial integrity, there's no question at all that China uh, still holds this very, very uh, dearly. Can well, I ask a question then? Um, sure. If that's the case, I would think that it would be relatively easy for, in addition to China, as they have publicly, the Chinese government publicly has called for a, uh, an end to the hostilities, a, a ceasefire and negotiated settlement, et cetera. Um, it would, it, if China were to adhere to its own principles here on foreign policy and international relations, why couldn't they say we want the ceasefire and negotiations uh, but that ultimately uh, all of Ukraine's sovereign territory, including Crimea, Donbass, and anything else that's been seized, must of course, as a result of that settlement, be returned to Ukraine. Well, I don't know uh, for sure, of course, from my perspective, but I think uh, the government has called for a ceasefire and a peaceful negotiation. As for the outcome, I think it's uh, up to, to the two uh, parties to decide what outcome would be uh, acceptable uh, to both of them. So I think uh, my understanding is China doesn't take a position as to whether Crimea, you know, where it belongs or whatever. Uh, the precondition is they can, as you know, stop the fighting as early as possible and then uh, settle for a uh, peaceful negotiation. And, and uh, as to why you know, the fighting cannot be stopped uh, as quickly as possible. I'm sure different people have different reasons. Many in China, uh, not necessarily our view, but a widely shared uh, view is, uh, unfortunately, they think NATO and the US is, you know, providing all this, uh, uh, all this military or financial support, uh, a kind of a, a, a way to actually uh, sustain the fighting instead of, uh, uh, you know, shortening the fighting. I'm not saying this is uh, uh, the, you know, every view, but it is a widely uh, held will uh, in China, just as uh, I would understand in the US people, you know, like, like uh, you know, Professor Goldstein just mentioned, you know, why can't China uh, just say that openly, right? So um, it's beyond my understanding, but uh, I'm 
just saying, you know, there are different views about this. I want to add some sentence. Uh, I think that uh, let's go back to um, Professor uh, Gordon Stan's question. I think it's also very hard for China to choose the stance because of uh, we don't know in US eyes what's the role of China. For example, 2000, uh, in 2003, in the anti terrorist war, we can find China support US uh, clearly. Because at that time, U.S. This don't choose to regard our China as the uh, as the enemy. But now we think that if U.S. need China's help, then why in the governmental documents, I think that U.S. still regard China as the as the I I think maybe as the challenger. I think <clears throat> so. That's why, that's why. It, because you, if 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 U.S. need uh, China's help, we need to cooperate. Then, but but when we are enemy, what can we do? I think that that is also the puzzle facing in front of China's government and the, our China. I think Chinese. That's a very helpful intervention, uh, Professor Chi, and it helps to move us to another phase of this conversation, which is really taking on the US-China dynamic uh, more directly than we have so far. Because in some ways, you know, the discussion now, um, you know, talking about different perspectives from the two countries could also have been held back in 2014 and, you know, similar kinds of perspectives. But uh, what is different, as you just noted, is that the US-China relationship is in a much worse position now than it was back in 2014. And, I'm curious what all of you will say about this, but maybe first to Susan uh, to speak a little bit about, you know, what's the bigger story here? Is the bigger story here what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, or is the story the downward uh, trajectory of the U.S.-China relations within which this is just another data point? You know, how do you, from your perspective, having, you know, thought about these issues for a very long time and worked on them for a very long time, um, what is the what is the real valence of the US-China dynamic within the way that we're talking about um, these questions? Yeah, these are huge questions, of course, and I'm probably gonna try to make it huger, which is I think that this is really about sort of the future of the international system and whether or not we are moving toward, you know, basically a return to a divided world that we saw this kind of bipolar world of the of the Cold War that I grew up in and spent my entire career trying to uh, rectify. Um, so, you know, again, for me, it's a very personal disappointment, but um, or can we find a way through all of these sort of major power, frankly, insecurities and, um, you know, <laughs> kind of uh, obsessions to try to make a, a, a more uh, stable environment and put constraints on major powers. I mean, the reason why the Russian invasion of Ukraine is so traumatic is because Russia is one of the five powers in the UN Security Council that has a veto and is supposed to be, although they haven't always been, um, you know, a responsible power that helps to uphold all of these uh, institutions and of course, major powers do not always abide by the constraints that they put forward to impose on others. And that is something that, you know, we all can have complaints about. And we, and China has a lot of complaints about that with regard to the US, and we understand that. But, you know, this is really about, is the international system going to continue to exist in a way that can promote stability and prosperity? Or are we going to revert back to um, a kind of a you know, jungle of major power sort of conflict and competition. And I think, um, you know, for the U.S.-China relationship in all of this, I mean, this is the, the, the sort of denouement of the last 20 years of missed opportunities in U.S.-China relations coming home to roost. And I am very sad to see it. Um, I don't know if we can get uh, over it and come up with some surprising way to sort of turn the relationship, which is really now on this very sharp downward trajectory, 
um, to try to stop and stem that downward slide. Um, the Russia-Ukraine events, I think, have made it harder, frankly, to turn the US-China relationship in a better direction because it's become now so easy in you know, popular discourse in the West to talk about this axis of autocracy and Russia and China being together. And, you know, most people are not uh, steeped in foreign affairs, certainly in the United States, most people don't pay much attention. And so this narrative, which sort of revives this kind of good guys versus bad guys, you know, good versus evil, us versus them, which is a very simple narrative in US you know, foreign policy will kind of take over again and be very hard to change. So, you know, I hope very much that, you know, we can find a way to cooperate as Dean Yao has written and many other Chinese actually have written um, that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to, to change things up. And as a diplomat, you know, that's the kind of opportunity that I would seize on and try to move. But I don't see, uh, frankly, that much uh, impetus being given to that on the U.S. side. I think the Europeans are quite interested in that, um, trying to figure out if there's something that could be done here. And we can talk maybe later about what the specific things that might be done. But um, that's how kind of I see the, the overall dynamic. Let me see if uh, Yang or Avery wants to weigh in on this. Um, but just before inviting them to do that, Susan, just a quick follow up all the reporting about uh, Secretary Blinken's speech has seemed to indicate that um, it's going to tie China and Russia very close together um, and not offer any kind of you know, off-ramp uh, to China. And we discussed this in a conversation on Twitter Spaces yesterday. Um, Robert Daly from the Kissinger Institute said that that's part of a strategy from the US side to just make um, that uh, axis very clear um, and continue to kind of hammer home that point. Um, do you think that's right? Is that what we're likely to see in the speech? And do you think that's a, is that the approach that you would have taken? Well, I'm very curious about why this speech was rushed out for this week, um, because I don't know that there was necessarily any urgency and certainly the Ukraine events are taking prime place in foreign policy. My sense is that there are people who focus on Asia who are worried. And, you know, I've been at the center of the pivot to Asia multiple times in the State Department over the last couple of decades. And it's been so hard for the United States to pivot because it's very hard if you don't have a crisis in our system to devote a lot of resources and energy to something in foreign policy. And, you know, maybe the people that focus on Asia are worried that they see that Ukraine is doing the same thing again to the pivot that has been done multiple times before by other crises. And they want to reestablish that, you know, China is our focal point, even if it looks today like it's not. I'm not sure about the tying together of China and Russia, and we'll just have to wait and see. If that's the case, I find that extremely unfortunate and cynical, but, um, you know, we'll have to see. Yeah, I can be brief because I basically agree with everything Susan said, um, although in the United States, we each have our own opinions, but um, I think she's nailed this pretty uh, closely to what I would have said. Um, I do think that one thing we ought to toss in here, maybe we'll get to it later, uh, is that the, the current situation and the way the United States has defined it as not just, not just about uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and the violation of the principle of territorial integrity and all of that stuff, uh, but as a struggle between uh, autocracy and democracy um, indicates what, at least one of the ways in which this is going to make it much harder for the U.S. and China to address the most dangerous bilateral issue, which is the handling of the, the Taiwan case, um, and that it increases the likelihood that in the United States, uh, support for, especially within Congress, but not just within Congress, for Taiwan um, as a democracy being faced by pressure from an autocracy uh, and arguments on the military dimension about the kinds of increased military support some of the United States would wanna to provide to Taiwan so that they don't suffer the fate that Ukraine uh, suffered. Um, I think this is a poor parallel of these two cases, but I do think as a political reality, that's 
seems to be what's happening. And uh, for that reason, I do think the Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine is going to uh, further aggravate US-China relations. And if the reports about uh, Secretary of State Blinken's speech are correct, uh, I agree with Susan that this is um, not in America's interest. Uh, if I may, I'll just uh, maybe also uh, point out to some of the uh, maybe less groomy, uh, you know, uh, points in the relationship. I think uh, a lot of people were worried about uh, from the beginning since February uh, when the war broke out that China would uh, provide uh, material or substantial military help to Russia. And uh, that has happened. I think that um, in many people's uh, views will not happen. And a very important article by uh, Tsinghua University Professor Yan Xue Tong uh, just a few days ago published in Foreign Affairs website pointed out very clearly. I think that's uh, widely also uh, held uh, uh, view in China that China certainly is not Russia. Uh, we have different um, you know, goals in terms of future development. We have different, and I would say, uh, systems. We have different uh, understandings of, of uh, the U.S. Maybe to to a, a lesser degree, but it, it's different. So I think um, any kind of uh, view or attempt to link China, uh, identify uh, China as Russia, or you know, put them together in a camp or, or, or boat is uh, not only uh, you know, empirically wrong, but also uh, very risky in terms of uh, foreign policy. And this um, maybe unfortunately has not been emphasized enough in the US discourse as you know, both Avery and Sudan, you just pointed out. But also I think um, the, this is uh, just one example by not providing military uh, support to Russia, but also signals a potential uh, scenario for US-China cooperation, or at least not uh, further, uh, you know, the kind of you know, conflict that we all worry about. I think there is still room for uh, diplomacy. It's uh, probably uh, too early to say that uh, this would only, uh, you know, make things worse for US-China relationship. But again, US-China relationship is very complex, not only affected by the current, you know, Russia-Ukraine war conflict, but also affected by so many other factors like trade, tech competition. So I don't think, uh, you know, China is not a direct party of the war or conflict. U.S. is not a direct party uh, of the war either, unless, you know, you put, you know, NATO and the U.S. in that uh, category. So I think um, this is um, maybe one reason why we can in the end, still find some room for uh, cooperation or at least the coordination if cooperation is not the, the kind of best word you want to hear from the US discourse these days. So maybe this is an occasion to um, invite Yang to say more about uh, his ideas in that Project Syndicate piece. Um, and in posing that to you, uh, I, I wonder, you know, it seems to me that even just you yourself in our conversation today have expressed two different kinds of views that um, apparently have currency within the Chinese policy world. So one kind of view is to not want the U.S. to continue to be sort of the dominant power on the world stage and to want to encourage more multipolarity. Um, but then another view is to want to at least try to preserve a healthy, positive US-China dynamic. And so obviously those can be in competition with one another and it gives a lot of different choices to Chinese policymakers to think through. So maybe you can say a few words now about you know, how those two types of things uh, work themselves out in your own mind and in your own proposal and how you think that resonates within the Chinese policy world. Uh, well, I, I think you are also right. Uh, there are the two kinds of views in China. Uh, but uh, at least uh, from my perspective and uh, our, you know, we, we, we have a long-term uh, US-China economic dialogue. We have been doing this since 2010. So within our group, uh, we always believe that uh, there should be only one 
world order, right? only one world order. That's the order uh, uh, that was created by the United States and maintained by the United States. But in the meantime, of course, uh, we call for more participation in the decision making, right? So, uh, you know, China, uh, Russia, and, other, and also other countries in uh, Global South uh, should have more opportunity uh, to get into uh, the decision making process of the world order. Uh, so that's uh, our view, and we still hold this uh, our view. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, if uh, we just observe what has been going on in China in the last decade from the perspective of our scholar, uh, we can point out, uh, point out the many factors uh, that are leading China uh, away from our view, okay? Uh, one thing, of course, uh, China is becoming uh, much, much bigger in terms of uh, the size of the economy. Uh, China's influence uh, in the world is increasing so dramatically, actually uh, out of the expectations uh, of most of Chinese leaders. Okay. And also, uh, domestically, uh, people believe uh, that uh, China has done uh, so great economically, then we should give the Chinese political system some credits. Uh, this is uh, not just a, a view held by, you know, people within the party, within the government, but also by uh, uh, some scholars, including me, myself, okay? I, I think uh, on this point, uh, most uh, American uh, scholars uh, including those leading scholars, uh, have grossly missed the point. Right? Um, they, uh, to some extent, uh, has misled uh, the U.S. government to believe this is a competition between autocracy and the democracy. Uh, they haven't uh, done enough research on China. They just uh, discharge uh, uh, China's system as uh, you know, the best the transitory, right? Uh, one day China is going to move to democracy. That's not uh, correct, right? Uh, Chinese uh, political system is uh, deeply, deeply rooted in Chinese tradition. And I think, uh, uh, you know, with Chinese system here, it's going to be good for democracy to improve itself. At least you have a mirror. And in the mirror, you see yourself more clearly, right? Uh, so, it. It's just, uh, I really appreciate uh, the views expressed from my two American colleagues, uh, uh, sincerely. Uh, um, this, you know, words to come, if uh, we talk about uh, this uh, <laughs> democracy versus autocratic divide, that is going to uh, self-fulfill, okay? Uh, I, I don't think the United States uh, really want to see that uh, China and uh, Russia to become a uh, to form a real alliance, right? I think that's going to be a disaster for the West, okay? But if you always say, oh, it's going to be that, we're going to be that, that's going to happen, right? And so that, that's my question, uh, particularly to ask Susan, since you have worked in American government for so long, why the administration wants to frame US-China relationship in that perspective? Susan, it sounds like you have a, an easy question to answer. Oh boy. <laughs> so I guess first I would stipulate my own personal view that I think that the sort of reversion to this kind of ideological framing is a big mistake for US foreign policy. And um, so then you have to ask, well, if it's a mistake for foreign policy, why are they doing it? And I think the answer that you know I can't help but come to is for reasons of domestic policy. Now, of course, in US foreign policy, we always have had the problem of balancing our values, which is a really important ingredient of our foreign policy 
because of this history of our country and the fact that as President Biden likes to say, the United States was founded on an idea. Um, and so these sort of values in our foreign policy are actually much more important for the United States than they are for most other countries. But you have to balance that with national interests. And you know, in the previous administration, the Trump administration, I would say that we got pretty far away from values and over cranked on the national interests or maybe even even further, you could say something even further than that. Um, but you know, now in the Biden administration, the pendulum is swinging back pretty dramatically toward values, right? And um, that has to do with, you know, the political environment. Um, I think it also has a lot to do, frankly, with national sentiment, national um, confidence, and the need to sort of pump up national confidence. And this comes from, you know, we've talked about Afghanistan. We haven't talked about COVID, but, um, you know, just coming from sort of the last 30 years, coming through the unipolar moment towards something that is less unipolar. And I think, frankly, the Chinese government hasn't done a if, if you say that the US government hasn't done a good enough job in reckoning with Russia's loss of empire, I don't think I think maybe in the future we'll say that the Chinese government isn't doing a good enough job with reckoning with the changing dynamics in the international system and you know the dilemma that 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 Graham Allison identifies, which the Chinese government saw coming way back in the early 2000s when it talked about China's peaceful rise. So, I mean, that in a nutshell is kind of how I see this. Um, I'd be curious as to how others and Avery see it. I'll try to be brief again, because Susan uh, touched on some uh, key ideas that I would have uh, articulated as well. Um, two, two points I'd wanna make, um, I think as illustrations of the, the tensions in US foreign policy that Susan identified between values and maybe interests, uh, you can contrast the two President Bushes for the United States and the approach that the first President Bush took towards the war in Iraq and the approach the second President Bush took. And the one reflected mostly values. The first one was careful to, to hew to American interests and, uh, and be careful and prudent, as he would put it, in the exercise of American power. Um, but there is one thing I'd want to toss out, and I hope it's not too provocative, which is that some of the shift to the focus on values in the United States and this framing of autocracy versus democracy is also a reflection of coverage, uh, fair or not, and I think mostly it's fair, of changes that have taken place within China and the perception of, it's kind of brought into relief or has highlighted the uh, divergence between uh, the values that inform the Chinese political system and the values that inform the American political system, both of which don't always adhere to their values in practice. Uh, but I do think that uh, certainly the American understanding of what's been taking place in China over the, the past decade or so, uh, including events in Hong Kong, uh, as well as in Xinjiang, has uh, really uh, informed this shift to a focus on political ideology, values, whatever you want to call it, in the United States in thinking about US-China relations. Okay, thank you, Avery and Susan, for uh, giving us very uh, insightful comments on uh, the uh, question uh, of framing. Uh, now, maybe we can uh, move to the next question, which is uh, how can we uh, promote cooperation or uh, coordination, if you will, in US China relationship to mitigate the harm of the current uh, Russia Ukraine war conflict? And in other words, what would like uh, what would the US uh, like to see from China and what would China like to see from the US uh, in terms of actions and, and the policies so maybe we can ask Susan every first and then our Chinese experts can uh, respond later I feel like I'm monopolizing the conversation but I'll just toss out a few quick things um first um I think it's really important that we not blame one another um, for this conflict. So I don't think that China should keep saying that the US aims to prolong the war because we don't. 
And I don't think the U.S. should be accusing China of uh, accusing us of this. So I think we should try to both recognize that we both want an, you know, as quick an end to this fighting as we could possibly get. And we should talk about what are the ways in which that could be brought about. I, I do think that sort of putting preconditions on a negotiation is probably not the way to get quickly to um, you know, stop the fighting and start a negotiation. So uh, you know, we should probably each try to refrain from doing that, especially since it's the Ukrainians that are fighting the Russians. I'm not sure we'll see that from the American side, um, which always has a lot of ideas on these things. But um, I would say getting to negotiations as soon as possible, stopping the fight and getting a withdrawal is really important. I think there are a couple of other things. I mean, the media environment is really important in this and we should try to refrain from, you know, uh, putting things out, especially from the official outlets that amplify kind of spurious and negative claims, obviously. And that goes not just for the issue of Ukraine and Russia, uh, but I do think we should focus on the UN and try, I'm, I, I'm very worried about an escalation in this war. I think that would be in the interest of the United States and China clearly to prevent. And certainly the use of weapons of mass destruction in this conflict would be anathema to everyone, but especially our two countries that are P5 members. And I think we should try to get more activity in the UN, maybe a resolution that could be brought forward to uh, call on you know, parties to the conflict not to use weapons of mass destruction, see if we could get a vote in the UN on that. Obviously the um, continued uh, adherence to the sanctions and you know not supplying Russian military assistance is key. And I think China's already given uh, assurances on that, but I, I do worry the longer it drags on that uh, trade with Russia will come into the sites. So those are all things that I think we should be focused on. Yeah, there's not much to add to that, except um, I would say that this is all gonna be driven in part by the course of events within Ukraine. And um, if this turns out to be a war that drags on for years, which is potentially what happens, it's gonna be much more difficult to manage. I do agree that uh, working within the framework of the United, or trying to work within the framework of the UN uh, to facilitate some sort of a ceasefire and negotiations would be optimal. Uh, it'll be difficult though, because Russia is a P5 country and I'm not sure the United States is willing to take that course yet. I will also say that the idea that's been floated by some that China uh, could be a, somehow facilitate the negotiations, could be a mediator. I think that's probably not going to happen because I think China is not viewed as a completely neutral party uh, in this case. So I think that would be very difficult. I think it's better to try this through the United Nations. On weapons of mass destruction, the one thing I would say is if, it were to happen, and I think it's unlikely, but if uh, Russia were to use weapons of mass destruction in Ukraine, if China were not to take a clear stand in response to that, that would be potentially catastrophic for American perceptions of, of China and its uh, interests in the world. Yeah, Professor Yao and uh, Haisha. Uh, uh, well, I, we really appreciate uh, uh, the views uh, by our two American colleagues. Uh, uh, I agree with most of, most of what they have said, but I uh, just want to add one uh, thing. Um, probably China is not at the best position uh, to talk with uh, the Russians. Uh, right? uh, we all know that what uh, Russia uh, want, they want uh, respect from the West. Right? So it's better the West uh, particularly United States, or if the United States uh, doesn't want to do that, probably France right, uh, can be a, a good candidate to talk directly to uh, Russians, okay? Uh, I, I totally agree uh, with uh, Susan. I think uh, the possibility of uh, a nuclear war is very, very high. We didn't uh, stop the war, but we have to stop uh, a nuclear war. Okay, 
uh, this is uh, an imminent uh, threat. It's not something uh, remote. I, uh, so uh, so uh, this is uh, the responsibility for the whole world, particularly for European countries. Uh, so I, I believe Europe uh, should take the lead to talk with the Russia. Okay, <laughs> I think that uh, I want to point out uh, my opinion. First, I think that uh, uh, that uh, U.S. choose China as a potential challenger. That policy is maybe a mistake because I think that China don't want to challenge uh, U.S. leadership. So I think that maybe that that the pivot strategy may may be a policy uh, mainly sourced from the domestic consideration to gain uh, domestic support to um, for, uh, so so that the, uh, the the president can gain more public support i think so i think that is just a, a imagine imagine not a in reality uh, second i think that uh, uh, the, this war provide a good chance for all of the major states to re to consider again how to sustain the world peace. I think maybe <clears throat> based on the experience of the six party, uh, this uh, six party talk, I think that uh, now it, this is another chance for both China and the U.S. They can they can be the third party to help the both sides to negotiate to 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 uh to to find a uh, solution so that they can uh, avoid the disaster not only in the uh russia ukraine war and i also think that they can also cooperate in the uh in in other public to provide other kinds of public goods that's my opinion Thank you, Aisha. And I, I just would like to also add one uh, small comment, what China would like to see from the US. I think uh, my understanding is that uh, China wants the US to actually engage Russia directly uh, because you know Russia is fighting, uh, not China is fighting. So uh, I think Avery is very right in saying that, you know, if something like a nuclear weapon being used, uh, you know, uh, happens, that would really damage China-US relations very, very uh, significantly. But I think, um, you know, China cannot force Russia to stop the fighting. You know, I think the uh, US has some um, uh, much uh, more, you know, resources in the, in the, in the agency to uh, engage Russia, which is not uh, happening, uh, you know, a lot, at least not to the, uh, at the necessary levels. So uh, if, uh, if Russia can be, engaged in the Russia's, um, I think uh, we probably can all agree that Russia's uh, legitimate concerns can be considered and addressed. I think there is a greater opportunity for uh, the fighting to stop as early as possible and the negotiation to start. Uh, but uh, again, I think you know, all three countries maybe uh, can engage uh, this uh, together, but uh, right now it, it is, I would admit, very, very difficult. Uh, for many reasons. You know, reflecting on this incredibly rich and I think fruitful discussion, um, it's clear that there's some very distinct differences uh, in perspectives that uh, far predate this particular crisis and that are connected with much broader um, issues, um, but, are, but are sharp and real uh, at the moment. But there also is um, some real commonality of interest and some potential ways in which that commonality of interest can be expressed, uh, whether or not that pathway will be taken, uh, none of us probably can predict. Um, but I think we can all probably agree that the world would be a better place if um, those pathways could be, could be uh, somehow developed. Um, and towards that, I think dialogues like this can be very helpful. So as we close here, uh, I just wanted to thank all of you on behalf of Ding Ding and myself and our producer, Amanda Morrison, for taking the time to do a conversation like this, which again, we think is relatively unique in the current moment um, to have US and Chinese experts talk about such relatively sensitive issues in a 
open, frank, and, and public way. Um, so thank you for doing that. And hopefully this can be some small contribution uh, to, the, to the wider goal of, of getting the US and China to um, maybe sharpen their commonalities uh, in this regard, uh, as opposed to their differences. So thank you all once again. Thank you all uh, to the listeners and the viewers for uh, staying with us through this conversation. And uh, Ding Ding and I will be back with more great episodes uh, in the future on other similar topics. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye-bye.